perfect. So coach, when you're ready, you can uh, go ahead and we'll get started with you. Yeah, uh, so um, first and foremost, I just wanted to, uh, to to say thank you to you, Nabs, for uh, for having me on here and, you know, obviously creating this this platform where, you know, coaches can come on here and, and learn and, and share um, the experiences that we have. So I'm, I'm flattered to, to be asked. Um, you know, I did one for Paul last week or a couple of weeks ago. So I'm flattered to be asked. I'm, I'm flattered that, you know, hopefully somebody, at least one person is uh, tuning in to, to hear what I have to say. Uh, because I, I feel like my journey is pretty unique as being an American who has really adopted uh, the, the Irish culture and is trying to, to change the culture a little bit. Uh, so when you gave me this topic, it was, uh, you know, I kind of I kind of struggled with it, putting this together to, to put it in a few words to, to describe the, the journey I've been on as far as, you know, adding to a culture that's already here. Um, there's so much stuff out there on culture building. And, you know, Mike, Mike Tulin did a great uh, clinic last week on here about about the, the state of the Irish basketball culture and the things that we might have to uh, to deal with. So there's there's so much on culture and you know I feel like changing the culture is such a very overused term um, that that everybody uses in sports. So I I'm, my goal here is not to be too cliche and just kind of say say what I've been through, say what my experience has been. Um, I was talking to Francis O'Sullivan last night and you know he dropped a gem on me that his wife Grace gave to him, he was just, and she said, basically culture is just the way we do things. So, you know, I'm gonna explain the way that I do things and, you know, some of the problems I've encountered and, you know, things I might need to improve on. And, um, you know, hopefully you guys get something out of that. Uh, Nabs, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so you can see here that I've, kind of been around the block. Um, these are just the different kind of cultures or clubs that I've gotten, gotten to be around. Um, this is just my, my time in Ireland. So, uh, you know, a lot of them are, are clubs I played for. You know, some of them I, I did camps with and, you know, Balancholic down there at the end is kind of just a, a club I've, I've looked to from afar um, to, to see what they've been doing the, the last few years, especially they've obviously been on everybody's radar because they've done so well. Uh, in the National League and, and now making their way up to Super League, but they've also, you know, done great things underage and, you know, just seeing how they're, they're piecing that together has always been interesting to me. Um, so I came here in 2007 and I started in Balina. Um So I came to a club that had a lot of star power with Liam McHale and Dior Marsh, who I'm sure anybody listening here in, in Ireland knows about. But uh, it was a club that I came to and I didn't really know the Irish scene and the underage structure. There wasn't a real, you know, there wasn't really a focus on the underage structure. So it was kind of, you know, you had Liam and, and Dior who you had depended on for a long time. And as they were getting older, you know, I was one of the, the three pros that, that were brought in. Um, so there wasn't much coming out of the underage. You know, it wasn't much. There just wasn't a lot happening. And you know, over the course of the, the two or three years that I was here, you know, Bell and I kind of lost the Super League team, lost the, the National League team they had, and now they're really trying to rebuild um, an underage structure. So, you know, that it was a, a quick lesson to me on, on kind of what to try to avoid um, because you, you never wanted to just kind of flame out. And I think Tralee kind of had the same thing a few years ago, and, and they've come back bigger and stronger now and as a united front with the Tralee Warriors. But you know, there's a couple of clubs who were kind of top heavy and dependent on pros a lot. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of saw how it didn't work out. And then I, I got the, the pleasure of, of going to Moy Cullen, which uh, I was there with them their first year in the Super League. And they're a club that continues, you know, I don't know what they have in the water and out in Moy Cullen, but they continue to just pump out, you know, Irish internationals year after year after year. And it seems like they're always in a cup semifinal or final at the under 18 or under 20 level. Um, so I got to see firsthand what it looked like from building something from the ground up. Uh, and I saw all the players who were the Super League players who were so willing to give their time back to their club. Um, and then, you know, obviously I got to coach NUIG, the college that was affiliated with them when I was there. Uh, so it was just, 
you know, it, it was really different for me to get to see that culture of, of, you know, really bringing people up from the ground up as opposed to what it was in Balna. And, you know, fast forward, I've, I've kind of been all over the place. Uh, I went to Cholester. Uh, I guess it was a good few years after they had uh, they had split. So Cholester was a club. They split with another club, Cubs. And I feel like most most clubs would have kind of been done after that. But it really uh, showed how, how tight-knit that Cholester was as a club. They were able to pull it together. Um, they still have a Super League men's and women's team. You know, the men's team won the cup two years ago, and then the, the women's team won the cup this past year. So, you know, to have that level of success at, at senior levels um, is just a credit to, to what they were and getting to see how much, how much the, you know, I was really close to the Grinnell, so how much they did behind the scenes and how much work it took to, to keep a, a club afloat, you know, really opened my eyes to a lot. Um, I've, you know, I've been in Kilkenny since 2012, uh, where I've been involved with the Kilkenny Stars underage club, and it was kind of just starting out. So that was kind of the beginning of me getting to, you know, put my influence on on a certain culture and, and try to change the culture. And I played with the National League team here, Team Kilkenny, for, for three years, um, where I moved to Temple Oak. And I think what I've learned most from Temple Oak is just that Sorry, kids are running around up there. But uh, just that sense of family and togetherness and, you know, them accepting me in and not looking at me as just an American coming into their club, but more, um, you know, a, a piece to the puzzle. Um, so I, I just felt very welcomed. And, you know, it's something that I want to to add to any culture that I'm a part of, just to make sure that everybody feels included and, and welcome. And, you know, so I've been to so many different clubs and camps and, you know, Clubs have let me uh, run their camps. I've been to Sligo All-Stars. I've done a lot with Shane O'Meara and Glenn Monaghan. And they're another club that's kind of, those two have done a lot of grunt work and, and put stuff in place so the kids will, will have an avenue to, you know, play even after they leave their club, which is unbelievable. Um, Rob White is doing great things with Dublin Lions. Uh, Father Matthews, I went down there and did a camp for them and got to see a club that actually went to that next step and, and actually they they built and, and put together their own gym, which is unbelievable for, for Ireland. Uh, Liffey Celtics was, is like the, you know, their their female side is, is very similar to what Moy Cullen is with all their Super League players kind of helping out in the club and, and really pushing that and, you know, not just helping out because they have to, but helping out because, you know, that's the, the rite of passage. That's what somebody did for them. So they're trying to give it back. Um, so just a lot of different cultures that I've been around that have given me an idea of, of what I wanted to create. You know, when I was setting out to, to start my, my basketball business, why not me? And just the, the clubs that I'm a part of, what I'm trying to add to it. Um, now, I just can go to the next one, please. Okay, so my intentions. Uh, when I came here, I... Uh, you know, first off, I didn't know I was going to I was going to end up and, and live in Ireland, obviously, um, you know, but, you know, fast forward 13 years and, and here I am. And, you know, my intentions for, for creating a culture or being a part of the culture is that, you know, number one, I'm a I'm a lifer. I'm a basketball lifer. Wherever I ended up on this earth, I was going to do something basketball. You know, I love watching it. I love teaching it. I love playing it. I love, man, talking about it. Just anything with basketball is is what I am. And uh, you know, I, I think that I didn't I didn't really have an intention at first to you know to to set everything up here. But you know, this this is what it is, and this is where I've created and, and started my family. So you know, my my first intention was just to be involved in basketball for as long as I possibly could because it's, it's given me so much in my life. Um, second intention is, you know, I, when I was 19 years old, I got why not me tattooed on my stomach as, you know, that was a mentality that I'd always lived by. And it was something that, you know, more than, than the culture I wanted to create, it was a mentality that I wanted to pass on that, uh, you know, this was my vision. I wanted to help people. Uh, I struggled. You know, coming up, I didn't have trainers. I didn't have people that that took time to to show me certain things. So I had to do it myself. And you know, for me, if if I can make that a little bit easier for for younger players coming up, then you know that's exactly what I'm going to do. 
Um, third one, probably the most important to me and, and probably most important to, to any parent who gets involved. Um, and a lot of coaches probably have this, this, and especially in Ireland, this is the reason why you get involved. You know, I have a young daughter um, and, you know, I, I never put any pressure on her to play the game. I don't care if she's high level. I don't care if, you know, she can't dribble the ball, which she can't do very well anyway. Um, so I had a young daughter and I wanted her to have the option, you know, so if, if she wanted to play this game and she wanted to play at a high level, then I'd be there for her. If she didn't, I'd be there for her, but I wanted her to see it through my eyes, how beautiful it was. So I wanted to set it. So like if she, I didn't want her to not choose basketball because she didn't see the very best with basketball, what this game could be. So it was just a motivation for me to, uh, to create something where, you know, she could either take it or leave it, but, you know, I was going to paint the picture the way that it needed to be painted. And then, you know, fourth, uh, I think what I what I brought to the table is is necessary. Um, it was something like the, the culture here. It wasn't uh, a very it wasn't a culture that was that was that took individual workouts um, very seriously. Um, there wasn't many people doing it uh, and just the constant wanting to get better. And I, I think I came with a certain energy and I've, I've brought I've brought something to every club that I've been to. And uh, so I think, you know, I came at a perfect time when, you know, basketball was really starting to boom here. So I think, you know, I was I haven't changed basketball at all here, but I've added a little tiny piece to it. So, you know, my intention was to, to help people. And I think coming in with that good intention, it, it was necessary. All right. Now, next next slide, please. Um, okay, so just getting into uh, so this is this is the code. This is my code, trust, commitment, care. This is the code we had at Davidson when I played at Davidson. Uh, we had it on a sign outside of our locker room, so every time we went in there, we had to we had to hit the sign. Uh, and this, it just man, it's, it's everything. It encompasses everything that I try to live my life by. Uh, it encompasses everything I try to to coach by and train players by. And, and try to be a father by and try to be a husband. So, you know, it's the, the basic questions of, of can I trust you? Um, can you trust me in this situation, in this certain relationship? Um, am I committed to this thing? You know, can I, can I trust that you're committed to this thing? And, you know, more than anything, especially when you're dealing with younger kids, I think, you know, do I care? Do they know that I care about them? Um, do they care enough to, you know, to, to do the other two? Do they care enough to stay committed do they care enough to become trustworthy? So it's just been the the pillar of of what my culture, what the culture that I'm trying to create is, is about. Um, and there on the left, you can see the, the seven keys that we kind of live by at Davidson. Um, this is kind of on the court, but it, it also goes to off the court. So seeing, talking, which everybody talks about, and, you know, not just like talking and, and saying ball, 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 deny, 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 stuff like that, but actually communicating. And, you know, getting somewhere and learning more about your teammates and learning where they are on the floor. Flesh-to-flesh uh, -flesh contact, which is just taught us to always be physical. Um, obviously, right now, during the COVID-19, we got we to gotta stay away from that flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact. So I should have put the Davidson six keys for now. But, uh, you know, everything that I was taught was just to be physical and not be afraid and to always initiate and not retaliate. Um, you know, then we got details, being attentive to details. And I think Mark has talked about that a lot in the last clinic just there, um, which was unbelievable. And it's, you know, it, it follows right what I learned from Coach McKillop and what I try to teach is, is always being detailed and, and thinking about the little things. Uh, always balanced. And this is being balanced in shooting, being balanced on the defensive end. Uh, if you're a point guard, making sure that the floor is always balanced. Um, and more so than that, just, just having a balanced life, making sure you're doing other things outside of basketball, um, you know, making sure your family life is always good and, and all those things off the court, uh, having an act being, you know, having deception when you're playing. And then most importantly is just finishing everything, um, you know, finishing your follow through, finishing your shot off, uh, finishing your defense with a, with a defensive rebound. Uh, if we're doing sprints or something in practice, it's just making sure you get to the finish line and, and, and don't go two meters, you know, don't don't cut it two meters short. Uh, just everything you start, just try to have that mentality that I'm gonna finish it, um, was, was bred into me at Davidson. And, you know, I've, I've tried to bring that forward. And 
So my philosophy with Why Not Me is, is more mentality, a few mentalities that I'm trying to create within players. You know, the Why Not Me mentality is just, uh, you know, like I said, I got this tattooed on me when I was 19 before I actually knew probably what it meant. But, you know, just the whole concept that there are so many successful people out here in the world that we have to uh, we have to believe that we can do that. You know, there's so many blueprints out there. And, you know, I what I try to bring along to the people that I'm around is that if you look at somebody and you see something and you see something in them that you want, then, you know, the fact that they've already got it means that that it's possible for me to get it. So just, you know, trying to teach to get outside of your own head and and to be willing to go through things to, to try to get what you want, you know, that it's already been done. Um, secondly, the notion of get to versus got to, and that's the idea of opportunity versus obligation. Um, not feeling like I, I have to do anything. Um, and, you know, I try to preach this at every camp that I do. Every time we get hands in to go to leave, I make sure that, that kids, you know, go and hug and, and thank their parents for the opportunity to come and, and be a part of a camp and, and they're spending their hard earned money for that. Um, that sense of gratitude and, you know, no sense of entitlement and just knowing that, you know, every time that I get to step on a court, it's a luxury. It's a, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. We're really lucky. And, you know, I'm fine with things now, even, even around the house, you know, having to, you know, empty the dishwasher or things like that, instead of feeling like, oh, I, I got to do this. It's more like, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to, to have a dishwasher to be able to unload. I'm blessed to, you know, have a, a lawn to cut. I'm blessed to do all these little things that, you know, I think it's it gets lost on on younger people these days because they have so much at their at their fingertips. Um, the the constant sense of urgency. Uh, so a term that I use with, with players, especially here in Kilkenny, because we're always kind of two steps back of the Dublins and the Corks and Galways and the bigger cities, is that you know we got to get better like yesterday. You know, so everybody is two steps ahead of us. So when we come on the court, uh, we just got to have this sense of urgency that, you know, we, we got to get better. We got to lock in. We got to be focused and we got to get something out of it all the time. Um, and, you know, then we'll skip the pit bulls one and, and marathon, not a sprint, probably seems like an antithesis to, to the constant sense of urgency. But, you know, the, the concept behind marathon, not a sprint is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly going, so I can't give everything I have on Monday and then Tuesday, I feel like I can take a day off from that. It's that constant pace, you know, and I want to be a world record marathon runner. So I'm not going to do a little bit today. You know, I'm not going to run a six minute mile in mile one. And then by mile 15, I'm running a 25 minute mile. You know, I'm, I'm on that six minute pace. I'm coming all the time and I'm, I'm going to keep going. It's a marathon. Uh, and then pit bulls is, you know, I think if you've been around me, you know, it's just, I just, I love dogs. I want a dog around me. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, some kids, when they first meet me and they hear me say all this, they're like, oh, they, they might be taken aback. But after they've been around me for, for a few, you know, a few sessions or a few camps or a few workouts or whatever, they understand the concept. And, uh, you know, funnily enough, my, uh, my daughter and some of the players that I coach, they come up to my games at Temple Oak and, um, every time I'm on the court, they just they start barking. And <laughs> and uh, I think people think it's a little bit crazy. But, uh, you know, to me, it's kind of like, OK, that's this is the culture starting to stick. You know, what I mean, they start barking because they know, you know, you're teaching us to be dogs. So, it, you know, it holds me accountable to be a do a do as I do kind of guy instead of a do as I say. So I'm I'm trying to breed pit bulls. And if you know what a pit bull is, they're ferocious and they're. They're not scared of anything and they protect their own. You know, that's the kind of people that I'm trying, trying to breed that, that come through any kind of program or anything that I'm doing. Uh, Nad, you can go to the next one, please. Okay, so uh, what does it look like? It's it's loud, man. I'm loud. You know, I'm, I'm a quiet natured guy off the court, but, you know, once, you, once I get on them lines, I'm, I'm just... It's, it's all the time. It's loud. It's energy. It starts with me. I'm greeting people and I'm, I'm trying to relay positive energy, even if I don't have it at the time. And, and then I'm hoping that players continue it. Um, I want constant engagement. 
Uh, it's always intense. Nobody ever walks. Nobody sits down. Uh, it's just, you know, always, like I said, we have to get better like yesterday. So that sense of urgency, um, you know, I, I don't, I try not to scream too much as a coach, you know, when I'm on the sidelines, but, you know, especially when I'm with underage and I'm trying to breed this culture into them, it's the, the couple times that I go crazy. Well, I go crazy a few, but the, the real times that I go crazy is when somebody like dies for a loose ball or falls on the ground and there's a dead ball. You know, if not all four players going over to pick them up, I'm calling a timeout and I'm going crazy at those four players. Or if somebody subs out of the game and they not everybody gets up to high five them, then, you know, I'm calling a timeout and I'm, I'm going crazy. And those are the times that, you know, the, the kids that play for me, they understand that those are the things that I care about. I don't care about you missing a shot. I don't care about you doing something wrong, turning the ball over. I care about you being there for a teammate and being loud and, and being encouraging all the time because I think, you know, just being quiet and, and staying to yourself is, that's not what I'm trying to create here. Uh, game of mistakes. So, you know, I think if you follow me on social media, um, you know that I, I try a lot of different stuff, man. I try, I go out of my way to, to just really challenge myself. So if, if you thought you were coming into one of my practices or, workouts or or camp and and everything was like beautiful basketball it is not it's ugly and people are making a lot of mistakes and i'm encouraging that all the time i say to the players that i work out like if you work out with me and you are shooting 85 90 percent then you know you should probably get rid of me because i'm doing you a disservice because i'm not making it realistic for you i'm not getting you outside of your box and you know what i mean I'm, i'm trying to make you struggle i'm trying to see you struggle because then you, we see what you're made of. So, you know, I create that atmosphere where, where failure is okay and it's applauded and it's encouraged, um, you know, and it's, it's unbelievable to see, you know, how much resolve kids actually have when you allow them to be in that situation where, you know, they see that it's okay to fail, you know what I mean? So people are going hard constantly um, and the better players are always encouraging the, the, the weaker players and the weaker players, even if they see, I, I feel like it's gotten to a point now that even if they see the better players doing something wrong, they're, they're willing to step up and say it, you know, so it's iron sharpens iron. So, you know, I'm going to pick you up when you fall. I'm going to help you out when you fail. And we're going to do that for each other. And, you know, even if I'm at a camp and you're at a, you at a club that, uh, that we're rivals, then we can come together for this hour and a half, two hours, and, and we can, you know what I mean, we can break bread and we can get better, and, you know, that's how the game progresses. Um, thirdly is is hip-hop, man. This uh, It's a hip-hop game. Uh, you know, it's probably different from a lot of coaches. I'm probably a lot more laid back, but it's fun to me. I, I learned the game through hip-hop. Um, it, it, you know, it taught me the beat and the cadence of the game, and, you know, so any gym that, that I'm a part of and you know, Mark Keenan, our our head coach for Temple O, he, he hated it because anytime I beat him to the gym, I had to jump bumping before he got there. Um, any gym I come into is, is bumping. And Nabil, you know, because I worked your camp and I walked in your camp with my speaker on my shoulder. I feel like I'm in the 80s, you know, with the boom box. And it's just creating that culture of, uh, you know, it's just fun and it's laid back. But but it's, you know, hard work is is the prerequisite for that. So, you know, I coach an under 12 team this year uh, and they practice right under after my under 18 girls. And my under 18 girls obviously had it bumping with the music and blah, 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 whatever. So I didn't allow my under 12 girls to have the speaker on yet because I didn't feel like they had earned that yet. So it's kind of a rite of passage. You know, we work our asses off and then we get to the stage where, you know, we 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 can have this this luxury of having music and, and feeling good at practice. Um, and I think that also just adds with, to, to me trying to just keep up with trends. Uh, you know, everybody, all the kids now deal with like Instagram, TikTok. So, uh, you know, instead of shunning all that stuff and, and running away from it, I've kind of embraced all of it. And, you know, I embrace the, the new music that comes on. And, you know, I never thought I'd be, you know, a, a black American in Ireland and learning about the new hip hop from, you know, 13 14 year old irish girls you know it's just crazy so the the way <laughs> that my life has changed is uh it keeps me young um the game keeps me young the culture keeps me young but it's you know it's a young man's game so i i try to i try to stay true to that um and then 
lastly is just competitiveness all the time with yourself. I, I chart a lot of things. We do drills where you can go against yourself. I'm obviously trying to beat people all the time, but you know, it's, it's more trying to beat myself from yesterday. Um, you know, those small victories of doing a little bit better on a drill than I did the day before. Uh, but I, it, it's a one-on-one -on -one culture. So I feel like if you can learn how to beat somebody one-on-one, -on -one, then, you know what I mean? Then you, we can talk about decision-making, but if you can't beat somebody one-on-one, -on -one, then, you know, you might as well cancel Christmas. So, uh, so it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. And, you know, just something I took from Mike Tulin the other day, he said, you know, kind of when a new kid comes on board that he doesn't really, uh, he doesn't really let them go against the, the stronger kids. And I think I'm just the exact opposite. You know, if there's a new kid that comes in, um, I'm hoping that my dogs, my better players are, are going to seek them out and be like, yo, I'm going to see what you're made of. And for me, it's, it's that culture where if this new kid goes in there and they get scored on or get beat every single time, you know, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. And I'll explain that to him or her and explain that, you know, if you, if you trust us, if you trust this whole process and you keep working, we'll work tactically and technically and all that stuff. And you'll learn how to play basketball. Right. But if they come in that first day and God forbid they stop our superstar player, whatever it is, that that superstar player, they're going to get an earful from me and they're going to get it from their teammates. And, you know, we're going we're going to slag and go back and forth. And, um, you know, so the and, and for the new kids that come in, getting that stop and and seeing that uh, just seeing that rapport with with the other kids, it, it brings them in straight away. So that's a little victory for them. So. You know, I feel like that's confidence building. And even if they get scored on, it, it doesn't matter. So that's that's just kind of what the culture that I'm creating looks like. And that's nothing to talk about technically or tactically or what we're doing, or what I'm teaching. It's just what the gym looks like that these kids are involved in. Um, now, you can go to the next one, please. Um, so senior senior versus underage, it's, it's obviously a little bit different. Um, so what I've found is that it is hard to change an adult team, harder to change an adult team than it is an underage team. And then even furthermore, it's for me as, as the director of coaches with, with Kilkenny Stars now, um, and just constantly looking for, for more coaches to, to continue what I've kind of started with, with Why Not Me, um, it's harder to change an experienced coach to, to trying new things and willing to try new things than it is a newer coach. And then even a, next, a step further, harder to change a committee who've always done things a certain way um, as opposed to, to people who are just getting involved in basketball. So the way that I do it with, with everybody, with teams, with, you know, with everything is, is you find a leader. You know what I mean? So if I'm trying to get through to a team, you know, I go find the best player and I try to connect with them. And I try to get them to have a buy-in. So if I'm with a new club and, and I want to change the way they do things, say I want to change style of play or something like that, I go find the senior coach in that in that club and I break down, this is why my philosophy is this way. Uh, this is what I think we should do. And if they're on board, um, then, then other coaches, you know, slowly but surely start to get on board as well. And then, you know, that's how we affect change. But I always, you know, it's the same if you're a player. Like if you want to, beat a star team if you want to beat a star set of team you take out the head of the snake first who's the main guy we take that person out once we take that person out then everything else falls into place so you know if i want to infect change then i have to find whoever is is, is in charge of, of this culture that's already set and i'm trying to to go get that um so for me like if you listen to michael Bree's uh, presentation the other day that he did with fusion basketball um, and if you haven't, I, I encourage you to do so. He was talking about how when he started, he coached kids the same way he coached adults. And, you know, I, I'd say I probably did the same thing, um, just not knowing any better, just kind of coming from the, you know, being a professional for so long. So it's, you know, this is the way I do things. This is the way I'm going to teach you to do things. But, you know, I've obviously learned there's a lot of differences, but I think there are non-negotiables that should should and, and probably will be similar for, for adults and for kids. Um, and with my under 18 girls, I kind of, the last two or three years, I've gotten them to to all write down what their non-negotiables are. And non-negotiable is just something that, you know, there's 
there's no bending for that. So if we're not doing that, you know, I can call a huddle. I can bring people in. I can call you out for it, you know, and, and we can go our, go back to, to what we were doing. And, but non-negotiable is just, you know, it doesn't break. And I think I, I might have got that from Alan Kane. And, and, you know, a lot of people deal with non-negotiables. But, uh, you know, I did it with Temple Oak the last couple of years as well. And, you know, I get everybody to write it down. And I kind of come to a consensus of what our three non-negotiables are. And funnily enough, it was uh, it was the exact same, you know, the, my my under 18 girls and and, you know, all these pros and, and high level guys from Temple O, they came up with uh, mental toughness and having that next play mentality, um, you know, not letting the refs affect them or not letting, you know, coaches when you yell at them or get on you affect you. And, you know, just just having that ability to move on to the next play. And then second was communication. Uh, and just being able to talk through everything. And, you know, I always say over talk. You know, I want you to over talk. So whatever you see, just say it. Let people know um, so we can get on the same page. And third, just being unselfish. So, um, you know, those are the the non-negotiables that we had. And, you know, obviously you have to kind of make it for kind of under 12, under 13, under 14, because they don't they don't know how to word what, what a non-negotiable is yet. But, you know, I think kids are a lot smarter than what we think they are, you know, so, so giving them the ability to, to hold themselves accountable, like once they're presented with that, they can, they can run with that. They're a lot better suited for than I think we realize. Um, practice habits is, is a big one for seniors and for, for underage. It's just come early, be engaged, stay after. Um, you know, I talk about the one-on-one uh, mentality I'm trying to create and, you know, you, you can see me after, Every practice with Temple O gets everything is one on one with the younger guys. Uh, you can see anybody who who has time after practice with any of my underage practices. I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to challenge somebody and just play one on one and just just fall in love with, with being competitive and, and loving the game and, and being a part and being in it, you know. And then the the trickle down effect is uh, is huge in Ireland, like especially because we're not a professional league. Uh, kids are going to mimic what they see the best player doing. Um, this idea of, of servant leadership is huge. Um, and this is why I mentioned the likes of, uh, you know, the likes of Moy Cullen and, and Liffey Celtics, um, Balancholic, just having these these players at the higher level going back and coaching our youth teams um, and really, you know, paying back what, what somebody did for them. Um, it's a huge thing and, and making that culture not just be at the senior level, but but making it trickle down to our to our younger players as well. Uh, Nabs, next one, please. Um, whew, just a lot. There's a lot on this uh, slide. So just problems I've encountered. Um, you know, and I'm sorry that the the uh, font is so small, but I just wanted to make sure I got all the the bullet points the bullet points in. Uh, so just problems I've encountered when I was here. It's just gym time. Uh, everybody has this problem. Everybody wants to be in the gym more. Uh, I always say, and I've had this discussion with a lot of friends and coaches that, you know, what could you actually do with the team if you had them every day? You know, like the academies or like they do back in the States, what what could you do with a team if you had them every day? And and that's part of the, the struggle here is, you know, how do I create a habit if I don't have them every day? And then you just hope that, you know, what you're doing in the days that you have them is creating that intrinsic motivation that's wanting to make them go do it now. Um, so I think this situation that we're in now is a, is a perfect time to see for me uh, what culture am I creating? You know, am I creating a culture where because we can't get in the gym and practice together and they can't be in the gym with me, are they sulking and, and just, you know, just watching TV and, and doing nothing? Or is have I created a culture where, where players are getting out and being creative and doing their own thing? Um, you know, so this is a this this COVID-19 thing is like a, a huge basketball experiment for me to see, you know, how much kids really love this game here in Ireland. And I think it's a lot, you know, and I've been impressed by the stuff that I've seen so far. Uh, parents, um, man, parents are tough in every sport, I think. Um, and, and I am one. And, you know, I, I, I happen to have to coach my daughter. I wish I didn't have to, but I happen to coach her right now. But you know, I, I'd hope that if she was playing for somebody else and I wasn't a basketball guy, that I'd, I'd be able to be supportive without stepping over the line, you know. But, 
you know, parents are not always in line with this us against everybody mentality that we try to create within our teams and, and, and whatever, um, you know, they try to make it individual. So I, I feel like my job has been trying to let each individual player know that I, that I care about their individual needs. I care about, you know, if they want to make Irish teams, I care about what they want to do with the game. I care that they want to score. Like it matters to me, but they have to understand that that has to fit into our team framework as well. Um, you know, history, history is a big problem, you know, in the grand scheme of things here in Ireland, you know, basketball is, is pretty low on the totem pole. You know, there's soccer or rugby, uh, GAA sports, you know, hurling and football. Um, so there's a, for girls, there's, there's hockey and Kilkenny is a big thing. So it's, you know, I feel like we're, we're always fighting, um, other sports and, and we're a second chance, we're a second choice sport, you know, so there's never really a history of, of working on your game in the off season. It was kind of like I finished basketball and I go right into the next, the next sport, which is great. And I, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't preach about anything about early specialization or anything like that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like those teachers you have where, where every teacher, your English teacher, your geography teacher, every teacher feels like they're the only class you have, you know, so they feel like your English teacher is giving you three hours of homework. You know, your, your math teacher is giving you two hours of homework and now you're, you're bogged down with all of this. So this is what I've been trying to avoid. It's like, I want you to go play those other sports, but I also want you to carve 15 or 20 or 30 minutes out a day to, to keep your game sharp even when we're out of season. Um, so history and just trying to fight all those sports and, and, and you know, just try to just just find a place for, for basketball in there is, has been hard for me. Um, inclusion versus competitiveness, I think every culture or every club with, with underage players deals with this. You know, can you be competitive at a young age, you know, without being obsessed with winning? Um, and which is was hard for me at first because, you know, obviously you come from a professional um, so I've, I've been a pro for 15 years and I've I played in college for four years before that and everything was predicated on winning. You know, it was win now, win now, win now. So how do you take that to an under 12 team who's trying to develop? And, you know, it was it was hard at first, but, you know, the challenge is, is to try to create players that are that are going to be good at the under 18, under 20 level instead of caring so much about what they are at the under 12 level. Um, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people talking about anyway. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was already a culture here, right? So I come over here with all these these grand ideas and style of play and, and you know, this hip hop culture and whatever I want to bring to the table. But basketball has already been a, a, a big thing here in Ireland. Well, not a big thing, but a thing anyway. So, you know, what do I do when I get here? Do, do I just get rid of everything? that's already existing and, and of course you don't, but you know, it's been a, uh, it's been, it's been just, it's been a struggle trying to not step on anybody's toes, but also not budge too much on, on what I think the game should be. Um, you know, just in politics in general, you know, people just always telling you what it should look like. Um, and, and if you listen to everybody who's in your ear, then uh, I don't think we're ever going to make any progress with anything. So, for me, it was just just staying true to what I believed in and trying to move the game forward is, uh, you know, it's, it's always just hard because because people obviously have their own opinions about it. Uh, and like I said, getting caught up in the scheme of winning. Um, and for me personally, because I get to work with so many players uh, individually, uh, when I was a little bit younger, it was kind of like, look at the player that I made. You know what I mean? Look, look, at, look at this player who made an Irish team because I trained them and it was – you know, I just had to get out of that because it just begs the question of, of why are you really doing this? Why did you get involved in doing it? And that idea of servitude and I'm doing, I'm here as a service to people and not to try to make my name any bigger by, by training this player, you know? Um, so the problem, the biggest problem that I've had lately uh, is, is just doing too much on my own. You know, last year in Kilkenny, you know, I was I was traveling up and down to Dublin two, three times a week to play with Temple Oak. I was also coaching uh, seven or eight teams um, in Kilkenny Stars. And then I was doing a, an, another academy on top of that. So uh, it was just, you know, obviously you get burnt out. You have this vision, but 
you know, one of my biggest problems that I haven't shared that vision enough with other coaches to, to get up to, to where I am as far as, as caring about it and, and seeing it through. So this is, this is my goal going forward is to bring more people along with me. Um, and then lastly, it's, it's just choosing this culture, you know, which for me has become my lifestyle, um, sometimes over, over friendships, um, you know, and sometimes you have to make hard choices with friends in a club. You have to, you know, tell them that they're, they can't, they can't coach this team. And, you know, even with players, I've had to, you know, I was, I was the assistant coach with the Irish team, uh, four years ago or three years ago with Colin O'Reilly. And we cut Barry Drum, who is my best friend. And it was nothing to do with culture, but um, just being in that situation where you have to make this choice that, you know, he's not picked for the final 12 of a team and you have to make that phone call. Like, that's not always a fun thing. You know, in, in Temple Oak last year, we had to get rid of one of our Americans and bring somebody else in. And, you know, it was his livelihood. And, you know, it wasn't, again, it wasn't a culture thing why we got rid of him, but he just wasn't the right fit for us. Um, but, you know, just having conversations with him after that, it's, it's just it's not always easy. And you're you're kind of put in a situation where, you know, you have to choose uh, this, this the game and, and, and pushing it forward over certain things that you wish you didn't have to choose from, which is which is just tough. It's been tough for me anyway. Um, OK, now it's next one, please. Uh, so this is probably, uh, <laughs> I probably could have just put this slide here and this has been the whole talk because this is what it's supposed to be about, you know, how to be persistent, how I've persisted uh, and, you know, excuse the language on the first one, but I was talking to uh, Francis O'Sullivan yesterday and he, he broke this down to me, you know, and put it real, real simple and frank for me, simple and plain. And he just said, you know, you just got to understand that there's always some bullshit going on. And I think, you know, every coach out there, we understand that it's always some bullshit. It's always something going on. It's always something that we don't have any control over and we just have to brace ourselves for that. Um, so what I was telling Francis last night was that, uh, you know, when you're in the middle of it and you're so busy day in and day out, like nothing seems like too big of a challenge. You know what I mean? Like the times that it's hard is when we have all this time on our hands now. And you're thinking about like, all right, how do I how do I set up these academies for next year? How do I do this? How do I do that? Who's gonna coach this team? Uh, who's best for this team? Um, that's when it really starts to get on top of you. So I think, you know, while it's great to to get this outside perspective and be able to to look outside of things or look from the outside looking in right now, um, it is great to get that perspective. I think for me, it's just being in that in that grind and in that in that uh, in that space is, is, you know, I understand that the, the, there's some shit that's going to go on, but, you know, I'm going to, you know, you just, you make do with what needs to be done. Um, this is probably most important for how I've persisted and how I've just not cared about what people thought about what I was doing here. Um, I just, I find a comparison in my life, you know, so for me, you throw me in a basketball country that's, that's low on the totem pole. And you tell me that, that Irish basketball can't be great. You tell me that basketball in Kilkenny can't be great. And I just compare it to, uh, you know, situations that seemed impossible for me to get over or get out of. You know, my parents happened to get divorced when I was younger. Uh, growing up, we were, we were broke. You know, we didn't have any money. So everything was, everything was just hard. My mom worked her butt off to, to make sure we got what we needed. And, you know, I, I overcame all of that stuff. And, you know, obviously as a pro, I've been an undersized, uh, probably not athletic enough, not something enough in, in every facet of basketball, in every stage of my basketball career. So, uh, you know, coming to a country like this, I feel like, you know, God put me here for a reason, for some reason, because now I'm in this situation where you're in this country that nobody sees as a real basketball country. So it's just like, you know, easy to persist. I've, I've done this my whole life. Um, and then it's kind of like, you know, this this cycle of, of mediocrity that, that Ireland and, and for me, the, the Southeast has, has seemed to get in this rut of being in. Like, how do you break that? You know, what cycles have you broken in your life before this? Um, so, you know, again, for me, it's, uh, you know, I, I came from a family that not many people, you know, broke that barrier of, of actually going to college. 
So, so graduating for me was a big deal. I broke that cycle. So now, you know, my kids are, they're going to go to college and, you know, their kids are probably going to go to college. And I've, you know, just for me doing that, I've created that legacy. So I've broken a cycle before, um, you know, just the cycle of, you know, all the, the single parent homes that have, that have been in my family. I'm, I'm trying to break that. And by breaking that, you know, it, it just gives me confidence that, you know, I can break this, this cycle of, of mediocrity here. And maybe that seems like a far fetched dream and seems crazy, but you know, you see the name of my business is why not me? And that's, that's what I feel. Um, so it, it just gives me that constant motivation to, if I've done something uh, that I feel like is miraculous in my life, that, that this is no different for me. Um, I am uh, process driven all the time. My measuring stick is just is yesterday and, and that's it. Um, all I care about is, uh, you know, are my players a little bit better today than they were yesterday, right? So now I, I don't look at the, the grand scheme of things um, when I'm in it, like I said, you know, you know, when you're when you're in the mix of it, all you care about is, you know, am I making them better at this skill or this skill or this skill? Are they reading this or are they behaving this way? Am I am is that improving day to day? Uh, and then just a couple of quotes from from a few uh, clinics that I've seen over the last few weeks. Uh, Mike Bree said, just you know, teach them to love playing basketball. Just get them to love practice. You know, once they love practice and you know, like I said about my daughter, once she, if she, if she starts to love it, you know, for what it is and, and just for the game, then, then I've done my job, you know, just get them to love practice. Uh, Colin O'Reilly said, uh, professionalism is a mindset, which really stuck to me because at, at the academy that I ran for Basketball Island a couple of years ago, um, I would always have stuff on the board, like foam rolling, uh, their mobility stuff that the kids had to do beforehand. Um, so I just told them that I wanted them to have professional habits, you know, so at 13, 14 years old, I'm teaching these kids to have professional habits. And if they can get that, then that trickles down to, you know, if my under 14s are doing it, then my under 13s are going to see that under 12s. And that's why it's so important that it starts at the top, just, you know, teaching this professional mentality that the game is fun, but, you know, we have certain things that we have to do every day to, to be sharp, to be better. Um, and then, you know, a, a moniker that, that Francis and Balancholic live by is more of them for longer, for better, right? So instead of having that star player at under 12, and once you get to under 18, you have only this one player, um, you know, my goal is to have seven or eight or nine of those players, and I want them to play for longer than under 18s, and I want them to be better than, than what they, they could have been. Um, so it's always about the process, and which is, you know, a cliche, I know, but it's just – you know, it's true. And, and I try to live by it. And it's it's made the, the day to day, you know, struggle to, to create this culture has made it a little bit easier. Um, down here, I was always a curious player. Uh, you know, this is just the idea of having a growth mindset. So as a player, I was always curious to, to see what was the new drill or, or new skills being taught or the new things, the new cool things. I remember going and, and finding VHS tapes of like Gannon Baker and just trying to do all this, all this stuff, man. I just wanted to, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to try everything. You know what I mean? And that's made me, I think, a curious trainer. I want to know what everybody else is teaching. Um, I know, I want to know, I want to take from, from all of those people and, and bring into my own, what can I teach the players here? What's relevant? What's not? Uh, and, and for me now as a, as a young coach, it's, uh, you know, that curiosity seeps into that. Now I want to know new sets or new trends that are, that are being taught or, or practiced in, in Europe and NBA. Um, I want to know what the best are doing all the time. Right. So because I'm curious and I have, I think I have that growth mindset, it makes me seek out other curious individuals. Um, you know, like I said earlier, iron sharpens iron. And, you know, all it takes is, is one. So one curious player from, from a team that, that might not seem to have interest. And if you get that curious player and, and you pique their interest, then, you know, they're going to take that curiosity and, and it's going to seep down. It's funny, it's funny the way that works. So it's just always trying to seek out the, the people and, and trying to put that curiosity in people and make them think about the game and, and want to know more about the game. Um, and finally, uh, Something that Coach McKillop told us and that always stuck stuck out to me was help somebody help yourself. 
you know, so he, I think he first taught it to us in terms of setting screens. So, you know, what most people don't understand, but I mean, I'm sure most of you high level coaches who are listening understand is that, you know, the person that's usually open is not the person we're setting the screen for, it's the person that, that sets the screen. So, you know, if you help somebody by setting a great screen, um, usually you're going to be the one rewarded because you set such a great screen that you end up being open. So this is how it was taught to me. Um, and obviously it meant a lot more than just on the basketball court. So I've, I've tried to just never make it all about me. I think I am in a, a really uh, blessed position to, to be a player while I'm starting this coaching training uh, journey. So the fact that I've, I've been a player at a, at a pretty high level, so I know what it's like to be the, the man. I also know what it's like to be at the end of the bench. Um, I know what it's like to get cut from teams. I know what it's like to be fired. I know what it's like to be looked over. I know, like, I know from every different perspective of what a player is, has faced what it's like, because I've been that guy at, at different stages of my life. So uh, just trying to be empathetic with, with players and, you know, even with coaches, because, you know, there's a lot of things that, that coaches go through that they never get thanked for. Um, a lot of things that people on committees do for the club that they never get thanked for. Uh, so, you know, just trying to be empathetic to people and not make it about me and, and, and let it be about the game. And, you know, I'm always trying to provide a service because um, at the end of the day, us as coaches, are our servants of this game we're servants to to our players you know we're trying to uh we're trying to build players who have this sense of of the game that when they get to a certain age they'll feel like they can give that back and that's how you know the game is circular man it keeps going it keeps going and you know you see i have these flags on every one of my uh <laughs> every one of my slides it's uh you know it's a it's a shout out to the great late nipsey hustle who, uh, who always said the, the marathon continues. So the game is a marathon for me. And, uh, you know, so everything I do is I'm trying to create somebody else who's gonna pass it down to the next to the next generation. Um, so that's it for me. Um, Nav, you can come back on here and rescue me from all this talking I'm doing, please. You're doing a great job though. You're doing such a great job. So, uh, so yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, fire them away. I do know that we've kind of gone a little bit over time, um, but I just thought that he was in the middle of sharing a lot of good stuff, and and I decided not to not to interrupt him there. Um, I'll start off asking some questions. Hopefully, you guys have have your own questions, and you can fire them across to us. Uh, Coach, just the first one for me. It's not something you mentioned here, but uh, it's something me and you have kind of talked about briefly. Happy, happy, happy. Do you want to explain what that means? Because uh, obviously I know the backstory, but perhaps some of the other guys don't. So just maybe I'll. Uh, well, it's just it's just it's just like a constant reminder to myself. So I think everybody has cues, uh, cues, and and how to reset themselves and get them back to a to a good place. And uh, you know, I kind of say that when I'm when I'm shooting free throws and. You know, I've kind of put that in, in other players' minds when they're when they're doing something that's a really stressful environment. Um, you know, and, and one just video clip that, that stands out to me is there is a uh, clip of Ricky Rubio. You know, I don't I don't from, I don't remember who he was talking to, but it was just a real quick uh, YouTube like five second video. It was like, you know, be happy, enjoy it. He just said it to a teammate, and I was like, damn, like that's that's a lot. You know what I mean? Like if we can all take that all the time and just understand that this is a game and you know, that's why I just try to have fun with it all the time. And everybody is so uptight about, you know, stressful situations and, you know, the game gets crazy, but this is, this is fun. I'm happy all the time to be a part of this. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we go back to what you talked about, welcoming new kids and different concept, a different idea, different philosophy than Coach Mike Tulin. But you did mention that when the new kid comes in, you do, um, it's not that you ostracize them, you do feel, make them feel welcome. It's mm -hmm. not with the, who you pair them with, but it's the atmosphere that you create in, in the environment. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that atmosphere a little bit, please? Uh, so the atmosphere to me is everything. You know, so we can talk about culture, we can talk about you know, what you teach, but if you don't have an environment where they feel 
automatically comfortable, then, you know, it's, it's going to be a problem. So for me, when new kids come into there, um, what I hope that they feel when they come in the door is that they come in the door and they're automatically, automatically, without me having to say it, they're automatically getting fist bumps. Um, they're getting high fives. They're asking, you know, what school are you from? So automatically when they walk in the door, they feel a part of this family. And I talk about everything that I'm a part of. We talk about like teens as families. You know, I talk about why not me as a family, like Rend, uh, you know, you've established a family and, you know, I'm a, t I'm a part of all these different fraternities, these families, so that I feel like, you know, no matter where I go in the world, like if I step out on a basketball court, I, I feel at peace. And this is how I feel about the game. So this is what I've tried to establish in every atmosphere where, you know, somebody new and, you know, especially at young ages, when you're starting a new sport, um, you don't know if you're going to be good. You don't know if you're going to be crap. Uh, you don't know if you're going to be accepted. So as soon as you get that first fist bump, it's like, oh, man, you know what I mean? So this is what I want to create. And and like I've been a pro and I've had to go to all these different countries. Maybe I didn't speak the language. So you go in there and sometimes it's cold because it's like, you know, who is this guard? Like you have to prove yourself. You know what I mean? So I just wish that I would have been in certain situations where I just felt welcome straight away because the the quicker you feel welcome the more comfortable you are and like obviously the better you're going to perform as a basketball player then you know makes sense um next when you talked about obviously culture changing and you talked about politics and all that stuff so it, how do you keep going when you don't see progress at the rate that you know is possible um yeah but like that's a really really good question that's a really good question because uh, I think I want it to happen overnight. I think everybody wants the the improvement to happen overnight. And I think sometimes, especially when you're dealing with, with young kids, you drill something over and over and over again, and you feel like we got it. You'll have a practice where it's really good. And then the next week is like, yo, did we never do this ever before? You know what I mean? So there's certain situations and, and happenings like that. So then I think if you have enough of those situations happen where, you know, you you get on a high and then you're brought down, back down to the low, like you understand that the process or the progress that you wanted, the speed that you wanted to happen at, it, it, you don't dictate that. You know what I mean? Like as long as there's some kind of progress, it doesn't have to be monumental progress over the course of two months or three months. And then obviously when you get into the likes of where you are and, and you're, you know, a professional coach and your job depends on it. You're just hoping that the, the small increases in progress are enough to, to keep your bosses happy with you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Super. Sounds good. Um, next one. You know, I think, I think you're very different from, from a coaching standpoint. You can relate with your players really well. A lot of coaches, mm -hmm. uh, either we're afraid to get outside of our shell, we're afraid to kind of show our kid side, or, you know, we, we're not able to build that relationship. What advice would you give to coaches uh, so they can connect with their athletes on their level, on the level that the athlete needs? Yeah. Uh, so, like, I think this is, this is really hard for, for some coaches who've never done it because obviously I'm a player and I've grown up uh, well, I'm not in this generation now, but, <laughs> you know, I'm a few generations removed of what was now. But uh, but I grew up a certain way. And, and this is how uh, this is how players act. So I'm a player first. So, you know, for people that that weren't players first and they're, you know, even players that are a few generations before me that are a little bit removed, um, then it means you have to get outside your box. And so say if hip hop or all this pop music is the, the popular music of today and you only like classical music, you know, you're gonna have to get outside your box and you listen to what they listen to and ask them questions about it. I promise you, if a six, like if I'm a 13 year old and my 60 year old under under 14 coach comes in and he's just like, yo, did you hear that, uh, that Roddy Rich, that new Roddy Rich? I promise you that 13 year old is gonna run through a brick wall for that, for that coach. You know what I mean? Not because he's a great coach, but because he is he has gone that extra mile to try to understand what, what I understand. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, my, my players took a different approach. They used to call me socially awkward 
trying to fit in with the young crowd. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that's different. But you gotta go through that, Nav. You gotta go through that, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, man, you know how hard it is for me to try to be cool with my under 12 team when I have my daughter on the team, just always constantly being embarrassed of me trying to dance and do this stupid stuff they're trying to do. I don't. I know I'm awkward. I know I make it weird, but <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm trying to show you that I'm I'm willing to look stupid to connect with you more. You know. Yeah, I think that's great. Actually, being willing to look stupid to connect with you more. I think that's something <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely steal. Uh, last question before I let you go. Um, just for the coaches, now we're coming to the end. Hopefully, we're coming to the end of this pandemic. Um, hopefully, restrictions are going to start lifting up. Uh, what advice would you give to coaches, or rather yourself? What's your mindset, and how do you expect to transition uh, with your players, with your teams, back into normality, whatever that might look like? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's sure, it's just it's, it's hard, man, because it's like you know we don't know when the restrictions are going to be lifted. We don't know when we're actually going to be able to get into a gym and and be together. So uh, so the way that I see it going is probably going to start off being we still can't. Um, you know, be competitive and, and you know, the the one on one competitive type stuff is probably we're still going to have to practice social distancing, you know, so um, it's going to start off being small workouts, which, uh, you know, is exactly what I've been trying to to preach to, to everybody anyway, to get in the gym and, and be together in small groups and get better. So I think it's going to really it's an opportunity for Ireland as a whole to add to our, our culture as a whole. You know what I mean? So we haven't really been a culture that, that deals too much in small group workouts or individual workouts. So as this pandemic unfolds and, and we get back to, to normalcy, uh, then we can add that to the repertoire of what we do. You know what I mean? So now instead of it only being two club practices a week, so now maybe, you know, three or four of the, of the girls that I coach, they might get together on their own and find a gym and, and find an outside court or something like that. And they work on some stuff or they play three on three and and that's the way we get back into it. So this is, you know, like I said, it's, a, it's an opportunity man. it's an opportunity for us to improve and for things to it can be a positive on this this crazy negative that we're going through, you know. Great. I know I said that was the last question. Um, this is a question <laughs> that just popped up here that I think is really interesting. So I thought I'll just uh, 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 shoot it across to you. How do you respond to the statement from coaches who say players should not have trainers? Uh, I mean, I like I. Well, obviously, I'm a trainer, so I'm going to disagree. Number one, but uh, but th but my goal as a trainer is to make it so you don't need me as a trainer. You know, I think that should be everybody's goal as a trainer. You know what I mean? So I think that after I work with you and I, I show you certain things, uh, my goal as a trainer should be to teach you how to work out by yourself. You know what I mean? If any trainer is doing anything different with you, then you know, I'm not just giving you a little bit so that you have to come back to me every week. You know, you come back to me because you feel like you get something out of it. But, you know, you should be able to get from me and I should be willing to share information with you that if you were by yourself, just like these times right now, you should be able to work out by yourself. But for coaches who say uh, kids don't need trainers, um, you know, you got to look at why. Why are they getting trainers? You know what I mean? Why are kids getting trainers? Train kids are getting trainers because they want to concentrate on certain skills and get better at certain skills. You know what I mean? If they can't do that on their own, then what is wrong with having a trainer? This is what I'm saying. So we don't want trainers that are going to completely contradict what we're doing as, as coaches. So I think it's important if I am training a kid uh, that, you know, I touch base with the coach that he's playing for and be like, look, I'm working on this and this and this with Johnny. Um, you know, I hope that doesn't mess up what you're trying to instill in him yourself, you know what I mean? And that's my job as a trainer. Perfect. We are out of time. We are over time. Really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, as usual, I enjoy I enjoy these conversations. Guys, thanks. thank you so much for all attending in. We are back tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock. So thank you, everyone. Talk to you soon. Appreciate you, Nav.